And good evening. President Biden will face no criminal charges over his handling of classified documents. But the special counsel report raises major concerns, saying Biden's practices, quote, present serious risks to national security. They added that the president showed diminished faculties and faulty memory when he was interviewed, adding that if they were to bring charges, Biden would likely present himself to a jury as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. These are some of the pictures from that report, boxes in the president's Delaware garage, some containing classified documents related to Afghanistan. Agents discovered numerous documents in unlocked and unauthorized locations. This filing cabinet containing daily memo notebooks from when Biden was vice president. Former President Trump weighing in saying, quote, this has now proven to be a two-tiered system of justice and unconstitutional selective prosecution. The report lays out the differences between Trump and Biden's classified document investigations, arguing Trump allegedly obstructed justice after being given chances more than once to return those documents. Moving forward, I'm joined tonight by Katie Cherkasky. She's a former federal prosecutor and criminal defense attorney. And Julia Manchester, she's a political reporter at The Hill. And NBC News White House reporter Catherine Doyle, who just posted a story with a team of ours from Washington about the political fallout of the document on NBCNews.com. We thank you all for joining Top Story tonight. Katie, I'm going to start with you. At the heart of this issue are two things, right? Whether or not Biden willfully disclosed about the classified documents. I want to put on the screen here what came out of the special counsel's report. And basically what they're saying is that there was evidence that when Mr. Biden decided to post this up here, and I just got to grab my notes here, um, he willfully retained his classified notebooks. That is, he knew he kept classified information in notebooks stored in his house, and he knew he was not allowed to do so. They go on to say, we conclude that this evidence does not establish Mr. Biden's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. We therefore decline prosecution of Mr. Biden based on his retention of his notebooks and disclosure of information in them. Katie, explain what they meant there, the legal argument for this. Well, it's actually really interesting because under the federal statute, in order to have a completed offense of retention of classified documents, you really only need to remove them with the intent to retain them, and that is the complete offense at that time. It doesn't take into account your state of mind down the road or at the present moment, but really at the time that the offense was committed. Um, essentially, what Robert Hur was saying here, though, is that even though they do have essentially enough evidence to meet the elements of that statute, that they feel that a prosecution could result in an acquittal because there is some reasonable doubt about some of his state of mind down the road and maybe even at the time given his status working for the government. So it, it's kind of a circular argument. Ultimately, prosecutors have discretion even when they do have evidence evidence that meets the elements of a statute, and they could indict, but th they chose not to do that here. Right. So they, they said he did it, but they chose not to indict, not to criminally charge him. And here's the reason why. The special counsel also wrote about this. I want you to walk us through this. Um, they addressed the likelihood of Biden ever facing prison time or fine, saying, quote, and this is it here, at the time of any trial or sentencing, Mr. Biden would be well into his 80s at an age when relatively few people are prosecuted. He has no criminal record, and he is highly unlikely to be sentenced to prison or assessed a significant fine. Mr. Biden has served the nation for nearly 50 years as president and vice president of the U.S. Unbalance, his record of service also supports the decision to forego criminal charges. Um, what do you make of that argument as well? Did they, did they somewhat feel sorry for him or they just they didn't think that he deserved to be charged? I think that they didn't want to open the can of worms of indicting him on this. I think that on a prosecutorial analysis, they certainly could have, and those considerations are really not directly applicable to whether there is probable cause, which is the standard you need to actually indict. But certainly, they raise some concerns about preceding practical considerations, really, but they're not really legal considerations, yeah. per se. So legally, a great outcome for the president, politically, not the same. Julie, I want to bring you into this part of the conversation. Um, this is what the special counsel had to say about Biden when they were interviewing him, and this is the political fallout from this. Mr. Biden, quote, would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview with him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. How do you think this affects Biden politically when focus groups, the first word that they usually say, according to NBC News' reporting, when Democratic focus groups, when they, when they ask voters how to describe President Biden, the first word they say is old, and poll after poll has, has concerns over his age? 
Well, Tom, it certainly gives fodder to his opponents. And we know that a pro-Trump super PAC is already pouncing on this, you know, talking about his age and how he was described. And, you know, Nikki Haley, who's still in the Republican primary, and polls show her in a head-to-head -head matchup with Biden, beating Biden. She has also pounced on the uh, president's age as well as the former president's age in a recent ad campaign calling them grumpy old men. So this is something that I think, uh, you know, politically definitely is not a victory for him. On top of that, we heard in some of his reaction to this report, President Biden talking about how he was able to, you know, do these interviews on October 8th and October 9th. That's important because that's a day, two days after the October 7th attack on Israel. Now, Biden said he obviously had a lot going on and he was able to cooperate despite, uh, you know, his government and, um, you know, national, national security apparatus and such being very much consumed by that. But at the same time, I think critics could probably look at that and say, you know, this attack had happened and you were taking part in this interview and there were questions about uh, your memory and maybe your cognitive awareness in those that interview. So I don't think it's politically great for the president. I'm not surprised the White House is very much hitting back on this, um, but expect Trump and Haley to uh, definitely zero in on it. Catherine, uh, you and our team in Washington have just dropped a very big story on NBC. NBCnews.com. I want to put it up on the screen now for our viewers so they can see the headline. It reads, a nightmare special counsel's assessment of Biden's mental fitness triggers Democratic panic. I want to read a portion here because this is just very, it's, it, the reporting is incredible here. This is a quote. This is beyond devastating, said another Democratic operative speaking on condition of anonymity to talk candidly about Biden's shortcomings. It confirms every doubt and concern that the voters have. If the only reason that didn't change is because he's too old to be charged, then how can he be president of the United States? Asked if her report changes the calculus for Democrats who expect Biden to be the party's nominee, the person said, quote, how the F does it not? Another Biden ally called it, quote, the worst day of his presidency. Catherine, talk to us more about some of NBC News's reporting now on the political fallout. Politically, it's a devastating report for Biden. Uh, his allies, uh, even some in the House, allies um, across the country are figuring out how to, how to respond to this, how they can defend, um, defend him in an upcoming election year where he's going up against Trump and voters are already concerned uh, about his age. And they're seeing him on the road occasionally, but they want to see more of him. And his allies are wondering how, uh, how, how they can tell voters that... Uh, even with uh, a prosecutor, even in a, with a report like this talking about his, his faculties, um, they can defend him and say that he's capable of running and, and serving as president for four more years. I mean, we heard from sources who described the report as a nightmare. Um, they called it devastating. Another Biden ally called it the worst day of his presidency, which is a pretty damning assessment, uh, given some of the things that have happened over the last years. Um, and one of them said that they really he needs to come out and show that this is a false characterization if that's how they feel they need to respond to it. And to do that, he needs to uh, appear before the public and really rebut some of the assessments that appeared in the in the report it, it's concerning a, it, his. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine, no, no. It, all important reporting there. Julia, I, I do want to ask you, The New York Times just has a story up now as well. Legal exoneration, political nightmare. There's still 270 days to go until the election, right? Uh, voters tend to forget things at times. Will they forget this? Will this just be a moment in time and we'll move on? Or do you think this sticks to Biden over the next few months as we head into November? Yeah, Tom, I don't think they're going to forget this because Republicans and President Biden's opponents won't let them forget it. They're going to be running this in ads and, you know, bringing it up in interviews. Trump's going to continue to be talking about it. I think the White House, their strategy is to hit back in terms of talking about the president's achievements and his record in the White House and even as vice president. So, you know, they're not going to they're not going to be able to forget this. There's just so many instances, even earlier this week of President Biden mixing up Angela Merkel for a former chancellor of Germany. Um, you know, in so many instances of him having these missteps that it's very easy to put together opposition research, a ta an ad, you know, what have you on the president and to make this case about his age. You know, Katie, I know you're here for the legal perspective, but but the story has sort of become the, the, the political fallout here. And as we heard in Gabe's report, they're already attacking the special counsel, Robert Hur, essentially 
essentially saying a couple of things. One, he was appointed by former President Trump. But a reminder, he was also appointed by Merrick Garland, right, the AG. And then you also have obviously the point that he's not a doctor, so he can't really diagnose any kind of mental capability. From reading the report by the special counsel, what was your take? Did you find it to be biased or was it fair? Well, the reality is that a lot of people are going to see this as special treatment, especially when President Trump is facing very similar allegations that President Biden could pardon him for at this point. Um, in terms of the analysis of Biden's mental health and facilities or faculties, I think that her was actually throwing him a bone because in order to explain, explain yeah. why there was potentially reasonable doubt in the case and in order to justify not indicting, he had to give some sort of explanation about that. And a large part of his report relied upon the idea that Biden would present to the jury in a manner that was confused. They couldn't establish the intent, the mens rea of the offense. And a lot of problems with prosecutions come about with the intent element. So, I mean, in a sense, I think that that was the best way he could actually throw him that bone and not recommend prosecution here. So to be clear, did the special counsel do anything that was unethical or anything that was out of bounds by talking about the memory gaps and then talking about the sympathy issue with the jury? Not in my view. I think that that was a reasonable explanation. He had to go through a detailed analysis about what he thought about prosecuting this case. And not only was there a probable cause, because obviously there is, but can you get a conviction here? What is going, this going to look like in a trial? And that's a practical question for, for him to analyze if he's going to move forward, especially with a, a sitting president. And, former president, as it were. Our great legal analyst, Danny Savalos here at NBC, he always likes to remind us that federal prosecutors only bring cases they know that they're going to win. They usually win, I think, more than 90 percent is what he says usually on our show. And we're going to hear from Danny in a second. But I want to ask you, do you think it was a fair assessment if they would have brought this case to a jury, they would have lost? Not necessarily. Not That's not my view at all. I think that it's very clear that they can meet the elements of those offenses. You there think are, they could have gotten a guilty verdict? It could have very well, because, okay. I, and I've prosecuted classified cases. There are many lower level executive branch employees that retain classified information and they prosecute them all the time. And so certainly there is absolutely a basis to proceed with something like this. Now, when you have... Wait, so are you surprised they didn't bring the case then? Not necessarily okay. because there are so many considerations with his status. And a big part of her justification was that because he had been working in the government for so long, he had had access to these things for so long, but he was subject to a security clearance. He's subject to the rules that are required to keep classified information in secure areas. Mm -hmm. And so that establishes the actual elements of the offense, but certainly because the report explains there's many other considerations aside from just the bare minimum right. evidence for those things. Katie, Julia, Catherine, we thank you all for joining Top Story tonight. There was a lot to get to there. We appreciate it all. Still a lot to get to in this show. We turn out of the other big headline today, the Supreme Court hearing arguments about whether Colorado can ban Republican frontrunner Donald Trump from the ballot. The justice is sounding skeptical after day of, a day of arguments. NBC's Laura Jarrett has more. Tonight, the Supreme Court weighing a monumental decision that could decide the presidential election, whether Republican frontrunner Donald Trump should be banned from the ballot. But many of the justices today seeming highly skeptical of Colorado's decision to disqualify him. It just doesn't seem like a state call. The justices forced to grapple with Mr. Trump's eligibility for office after six voters in Colorado successfully sued to get him removed from the state's primary ballot by pointing to his actions on January 6 and a provision in the 14th Amendment that disqualifies those who engaged in insurrection or rebellion from holding public office again. The attack was incited by a sitting president of the United States to disrupt the peaceful transfer of presidential power. All nine justices, both conservative and liberal, appearing to bristle at the potential far-reaching consequences of Colorado's argument. The question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. That seems quite extraordinary, doesn't it? Chief Justice John Roberts later raising the idea of the 14th Amendment being used as a political weapon by Democrats and Republicans alike. It'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. That's a pretty daunting consequence. Mr. Trump's lawyer arguing Congress, not states, must decide who is eligible for the presidency and that the former president did not engage in insurrection. This was a riot. It was not an insurrection. The events were shameful, criminal, violent, all of those things, but it did not qualify as insurrection. But 91-year-old Norma Anderson, one of the voters who brought the case, says she's not backing down, even if she loses. We just have to work hard to beat Donald Trump. 
because he will destroy our democracy. At the ballot box as opposed to at the courthouse. Yep. Yep. Mr. Trump also reacting to today's oral arguments. I thought our arguments were very, very strong. Can you take the person that's leading everywhere and say, hey, we're not going to let you run? You know, I think that's pretty tough to do, but uh, I'm leaving it up to the Supreme Court. Laura joins us outside the Supreme Court tonight. So, Laura, we know sometimes it can take time for the Supreme Court to reach a decision, but this one may come a little faster. Oh, I think for sure, Tom. The justices are well aware of the political calendar, just as any of us are. We know that Super Tuesday is just around the corner on March 5th, when dozens of states, including in Colorado and Maine, which have tried to disqualify the former president from the ballot, are set to go forward. So I imagine we are going to see a decision well before then. And then, Laura, if you can explain to our viewers, to be clear, we saw this ruling in the state Supreme Court in Colorado and also Maine. When the Supreme Court makes this decision, will it be a blanket ruling and affect all of our states? It's one of the things I'm going to be looking for to see just how sweeping it might be, Tom. You can imagine a situation in which they realize that there are dozens upon dozens of lawsuits coming behind this one in Colorado. And so if they decide to rule in the former president's favor, they might not want this issue to come back up. And so they're going to want to resolve it for all states. Okay, Laura Jarrett at the Supreme Court for us tonight. Laura, thank you for that. For more on this historical Supreme Court case, I want to bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, I want to listen to some more sound from the courtroom today as I'm getting handed some notes here over what we're about to see. Um, I want to talk about insurrection, right? Because a couple of the justices had questions about whether this was even an insurrection. Let's listen. If we review the facts, essentially, de novo, you want us all to just watch the video of the ellipse and then make a decision without any deference to or guidance from lower court fact-finding? That's unusual. If the concern you have, which I understand, is that insurrectionists should not be able to hold federal office, there is a tool to ensure that that does not happen, namely federal prosecution of insurrectionists. Uh, and if convicted, you, the Congress made clear you are automatically barred from holding a federal office. So I, I didn't go to law school, but tell me if I'm understanding the arguments here. They're asking the attorneys for the state of Colorado. Essentially, he hasn't been prosecuted yet. He hasn't been found guilty of being an insurrectionist yet. How can he then be an insurrectionist? Yeah, these are both really versions. They address different issues, but they can be boiled down to really the same theme, which is it's a familiar Kavanaugh refrain, which is who decides. So in the Amy Coney Barrett portion, you see her asking about, do we look at this de novo? She's saying essentially, well, how do we analyze whether the district court got it right? Remember, appellate courts do not normally reevaluate the conclusion that the district court arrived at as to the facts. The facts are essentially set in stone by the time you get to the appellate court. So Amy Coney Barrett is saying, well, what test are you asking us to apply? Are you asking us to look at the district court's facts de novo? That's not really what we do. At some point, one of the justices said, do we have our own mini trial here at the Supreme Court, which happens actually, not to get into it, it can happen in the Supreme Court, but extremely rarely and not in this circumstance. And then you have Kavanaugh asking a similar question. Well, what is insurrection? Does it require conviction under a separate federal insurrection statute? Or can you just say, hey, I'm a secretary of state and I now deem that you committed insurrection? It all comes back to who decides in very complex analyses that we heard today. But that's really how you boil it down. Who says thou art an insurrectionist? Right. I, I want to get our next soundbite ready to go. It's going to be from uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, but I want you to set it up here. This is where essentially a Chief Justice asks, if we rule on this, there's going to be a precedent here, and it could affect elections through the rest of time. Let's listen to it. I would expect that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others, uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. That's a pretty daunting consequence. Well, certainly, Your Honor, the fact that there are potential frivolous applications of a constitutional provision isn't a reason... Well, no, hold on. I mean, you might think they're frivolous, but probably the people who are bringing them may not think they're frivolous. Walk us through this, Danny. What did we just witness there? Yeah, I think Justice Roberts is concerned, really, that if they decide in favor of keeping the Colorado Supreme Court decision, uh, does it mean that every state, depending on whether they're run by a Democrat or Republican, we can just expect that there will be no of the opposite party on the ballot in that state and no candidate for president from the opposite party on that state? 
And I think the, uh, the, attorney, the uh, attorney's response, I think, was, look, sometimes you get confronted with a tough question. This was a tough question. And the response, uh, Justice Roberts saw right away that it wasn't a strong one. And because you can't just say, hey, well, if that happened, it would be frivolous. Yeah, well, just because you think it might be frivolous doesn't mean that people won't bring that case and the result won't happen. In other words, a safeguard against this rule isn't simply saying, oh, it won't happen. There's nothing to worry about because that would be frivolous. Hey, people bring a lot of frivolous litigation. People, what is frivolous to you isn't frivolous to somebody else. And nowhere is that, uh, that uh, truth more stark and more true than with people of opposite parties. Who had the better day today in court? Unquestionably, the Trump team. Uh, I, and I think uh, not because the, the lawyers all did a fine job. I think that uh, ultimately... There are too many opportunities for the court to find in favor of Trump. And on the contrary, for the, um, for the Colorado Supreme Court decision to stand, uh, too many things have to go right for them, if that makes sense. That being said, this was the, the question I was setting you up for, was that Team Trump today at the Supreme Court was much different than Team Trump in New York, in Florida? I mean, the president wasn't there. The former president wasn't there. First of all, there was no sort of outburst. It seemed like his attorney, who was defending his case, was on top of everything, was respectful of the, of the justices. Is this something the former president you think is going to pick up on? You, you probably can't answer that. But, but talk to me about stylistically the difference between this and some of his other court cases. I don't think Trump, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't even listen live. I don't think he takes any cues from his attorneys. I agree with you that his attorney took what I think was a very effective approach, which was he made concessions. And look, I've done appellate court arguments. It's one of the scariest things that you can do because uh, a smart judge will hone in on the weakness of your case and ask you questions, set a trap, and in, he did something that very few attorneys do that I found admirable. He made concessions. He essentially said, look, I agree that, ap that what we're urging here is a strange outcome. For example, that everybody else uh, in the federal government could be barred from holding office except the most important office. That may be an outcome, but guess what? Legislation, including amendments, they often go through and they're weirdly worded and they result in weird effects or weird outcomes. And that may be the case here. Strange it is, as it is, blame the framers. He didn't say that, but I'm paraphrasing his, what he was saying. I thought that was a really uh, important moment of honesty. I think the justices, if you listen back, I think they reacted well to that. And I think they were uh, a little tougher on the other side. But I think the other side had a harder yeah. argument to make. Okay, Danny Savalos, always great to have you here. We appreciate it. When we come back, an NBC News exclusive you'll first see here on Top Story. Five women who were sexually assaulted by a New York OBGYN sitting down with our Ellison Barber. The reports and pleas they say were ignored, allowing him to prey on hundreds of women for decades. This is a story you're not going to want to miss. Plus, a tragic update on the Marines who went missing in a helicopter crash in California. The grim recovery operation now underway. And Trader Joe's customers listen up the nationwide health alert about a product that may be in your freezer right now and could possibly contain rocks. We're going to explain. We'll have the details next. Back now with an NBC News exclusive you're seeing first on Top Story. Former New York City OBGYN Robert Haddon convicted of taking advantage of women when they were most vulnerable, sexually assaulting them under the guise of medical care while working at a prestigious hospital here in New York for more than two decades. Tonight, for the first time, we're hearing from a group of women who finally put a stop to it. They sat down with our Ellis and Barbara to share their stories. We want to warn you, the details are disturbing. I just thought no one was going to believe me. I was assaulted by my gynecologist. I was molested by Robert Haddon in 1993. Two days before the birth of my son, he sexually assaulted me. What is shocking to me is how little accountability there has been. Yeah, hi, Lori. It's Dr. Haddon calling. You know, I just got word that you called the office and you're upset and you were calling the police. What, what the heck happened? What, what's going on? That's a voicemail from Laurie Kenyak's then-gynecologist, Columbia University Dr. Robert Haddon, when he left just hours after sexually assaulting her at a postpartum checkup. Please, can, can we talk? I'm very upset. I, I don't know what, what's going on, so please, if, please 
please call me back. There was no one else in the room. I was naked in a paper gown, and here's a man that had the guts to orally assault me. All these things go through your mind. Who do I speak to? How do I get out of here? Who's going to believe me? It's my word against his. But Kenyak's word was the truth. She contacted the police and set off a decade-long struggle for justice. A disgraced doctor will be trading in his hospital scrubs for a prison jumpsuit. Robert Haddon was sentenced to 20 years behind bars today. In the end, it wasn't just her word against his. More than 700 women came forward to say they too were abused by the OBGYN over the course of his 25-year career. Five of them shared their stories with us. I think at that moment I was frozen and I couldn't do anything or say anything. The way I want to be remembered is that I did say something. Do you feel like he manipulated the system? Or do you feel like the system was set up in a way that just made this type of predatory abusive behavior easily achieved in this context? I think he picked a system where he knew he could use it to his advantage. Mm -hmm. He was opportunistic but he was methodical. Sometimes there were people in the room, sometimes there wasn't. Was he really using gloves? No. Yeah, no. Is that possible? Like, you would question it, but then he would, he would keep moving through it. In 2023, Haddon was sentenced to 20 years in prison after federal prosecutors proved he'd sexually abused patients between 1987 and 2012. The abuse was inexcusable the moment it began. But these former patients say Columbia had the chance to stop it years ago. I was molested by Robert Haddon in 1993. I wrote a letter of complaint to Columbia University detailing what he did. And the acting head of OBGYN wrote back and said, we'll be investigating this thoroughly. And he never contacted me again. In Diane Monson's 1994 letter reviewed by NBC News, she cited a number of troubling irregularities, including an unusually long breast exam and a pap smear that left her feeling violated. I did try to speak up when it happened in the hospital and I was just told that I was overreacting, that it had to do with me just giving birth a few hours before. If we really want to move forward from this, we need to be able to reflect on what happened, how it happened, and how we can prevent it from happening again. I shouldn't have been assaulted. I shouldn't be sitting here right now. Days after Laurie Kenyak spoke to the police, Haddon was allowed to return to work, seeing patients with a chaperone in the exam room. I would have friends call the office to try to make a fake appointment to, to just gauge how much longer they were going to allow this to happen. The next month, Haddon went on leave, and he never returned to work at Columbia. But four years went by before he was forced to give up his medical license, and four more before federal prosecutors got involved. Kenyak settled with Columbia in 2018. I was told I was the only one that's ever mentioned this to anybody. They told me, you're a single mom and a dancer. This is a lot of money for you. Go raise your daughter. The arrogance in that, as if they had done me this huge favor. And the reality was they'd failed to protect you in the first place. They'd had a heads up, a very detailed heads up, and they just ignored it. More than 220 survivors have now settled with Columbia. The ones we've spoken to say it's not enough. I feel like no amount of money is going to make me feel comfortable when I walk in a, in a clinic. A spokesperson for Columbia University Irving Medical Center says the institution is taking a series of actions to, quote, repair and rebuild trust, including committing to an external investigation, notifying former patients that Haddon was convicted, establishing a $100 million survivor settlement fund and reviewing its patient safety protocols. The spokesperson says Columbia, quote, recognizes that it was a failure not to take these actions earlier and is committed to charting a new path forward. How has this experience changed the way you all approach getting medical care? Completely for me. I think I can come with two hands the amount of times I've seen a doctor since I was 18 till now. And I just don't trust doctors. Going to gynecologists after that, I never told the doctors why it was traumatic. I just, it was always like a meltdown. Would I have had more children? Maybe, but I avoided OBGYNs, I avoided doctors. That is something that 
he and Columbia very tangibly took from us. Reflecting back on it, Haddon did a lot of sexual grooming over the years. What do you mean by that? The grooming behavior was the very long breast exams, checking to see if you have moles. We're, we're asking you uh, questions about your sex life. He was my first OBGYN, so I didn't have the standard of care or kind of the information. He didn't care if your spouse was there, your mom was there, the chaperone was there. He had the ways to do it for no one to notice. I feel like something really important for institutions to do, and Columbia certainly, to do is to educate women and girls with actually written material that explains this is the sequence of, of what will happen in your exam so that there's some way of knowing what's normal. In 2022, several of the women abused by Haddon lobbied for passage of the Adult Survivors Act in New York, which gave victims of sexual assault a one-year window to sue their abusers regardless of how long ago the assault happened. But the window closed last November. There shouldn't be no expiration day on you coming forward on, on an abuse that you suffer. What would be your message to another person, another young woman? If there was a patient of Haddon and you're watching and you're listening, you are most likely abused. Every single appointment that he had with a woman was um, an intention to abuse. Reach out to us, don't be afraid. You're not alone. There are currently at least 20 civil lawsuits that were filed under that Adult Survivors Act here in New York, still pending against Robert Haddon. But one important caveat there, survivors are not eligible for a payout from Columbia's new $100 million settlement fund if they've previously settled with the university or filed any legal claims related to the former doctor. Lawyers for Haddon did not respond to NBC's multiple requests for comment. Tom? Ellison, there's such powerful accounts here, and you, you cannot believe that this happened over decades. Um, from your conversations with these survivors, do you get a sense that they have any hope, any belief that the system will change? You know, I asked them that, and some of them said, maybe not in our lifetime, but what they're hoping is that it'll change for the next generation, for their children. You have to remember, all of these women, they're parents now, and they have children at different ages, and so many of them talked about having a daughter themselves, having to share their story with them as they approach their teen years, and also try to give them guidance they didn't have about what a visit with an OBGYN is supposed to look like, because it's uncomfortable for every woman to begin with, and sometimes you don't know what is normal, what is not, or you second guess yourself. So they're trying to eliminate that. They also say there was a protest at Columbia with medical students. Mm -hmm. They'd heard there were gonna be about 30 people wearing their white coats as a silent protest for the new president who was uh, being honored, inaugurated, if you will. And when they got there, they said hundreds of current medical students showed up to be a part of that silent protest. And they said that moment, was the one throughout all of this that gave them hope that maybe things will change because with the next generation of doctors, maybe they will do something differently. There were so many impactful moments from that interview, and I know you spent a lot of time with these five women. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to stay with you? You know, it's mind-boggling to just think how many of them looked at each other and they have this support system together, but the reality still is that there was that one woman, Diane Monson, who we spoke to, who said, I reported this in 1994. None of these other women had to be here. And the pain of that is something that is hard to get out of your head, but there's also just this amazing courage and optimism amongst these women about changing things, moving forward, and continuing on being good moms, living their life despite the trauma that they went through. And Haddon is in jail now, but there is still a lot they believe that Columbia needs to do to prevent this in the future, and also other medical institutions need to take a look at. Allison Barber, uh, I want to thank you and the, the team, the investigative team, all the producers that put that together. That was really a powerful report. And also those women that were so brave to come forward and share that story, because that's not easy either. Ellison, we thank you for that, okay? Uh, we're just getting breaking news into our newsroom right now. President Biden is set to speak tonight from the White House. This, of course, comes after a special counsel reported report raised major concerns, saying Biden's practices, quote, present serious risks 
to national security. Now, the decision was not to charge the president with any crimes concerning those classified documents. But inside the special counsel's report that was delivered to the attorney general were serious statements in regards to the president's memory, his mental capability, and things he just forgot. Uh, important things like when he was vice president's dates of when his son, Bo, had died that are raising big political questions for the White House tonight. We do know so far that the Biden-Harris re-election team has faced these questions, and they're saying essentially that this was uh, politics at play here, that the special counsel um, was biased. That being said, the special counsel, the special prosecutor in this case, was appointed by former President Trump, but was also appointed to this case by Attorney General Merrick Garland. Uh, we're waiting for the president at any moment to be fully transparent here. We got word of this just recently. Usually, uh, we can get a heads up and we know what the president's going to speak about, the topic at hand. We, don't, we do know he's going to speak in the diplomatic room. You can see the podium right there. What we don't know is a topic. We think he's going to address uh, the findings from the special counsel over his handling of those classified documents at his home in Delaware. But to be completely honest and completely transparent here, we have not been told what his remarks are going to be. What you're seeing right now are reporters that are gathering in the room along with some of the White House advanced staff that is going to prepare for this speech. We expect this speech to happen in less than two minutes, but it's still unclear again what the president's going to talk about. Again, we believe he will address the, the classified documents and the finding of the special counsel. But again, in full transparency, he could say anything tonight. We want to make sure our viewers at home know that as well. As, as we were saying, this is a live situation. We were just learning about this. You saw the TV bars come up. Sometimes that's going to happen when you have a live broadcast. To get you up to speed, though, if you haven't been following the news today, earlier today, the special counsel that was investigating the classified documents that were found at the private Delaware home and at the office at the Penn Center for former President Biden delivered his report to, the, to Congress and to the attorney general in that report, citing that he found evidence that the president willfully did disclose classified information, but that his findings, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have the report in front of me, he was not going to charge the president for a variety of reasons, including he thought a jury would be sympathetic to the president who is elderly and has memory problems. In their investigations with the former president, they found the president to forget several things, if you will. Those are my words, not their words, but important things, things like the dates of when he was vice president, the dates of when his son had passed away. We should say in full context, this investigation, this interview happened right after the October 7th attacks in Israel. Um, I understand that we also, uh, and so, so some of the Biden aides have said that to give this context, to put this into context, the president was dealing with a lot. He was dealing with a new war in the Middle East, at the same time being questioned about things that had happened years ago. I'm being told now we have one of our White House correspondents, Ali Rafa, uh, who's at the White House tonight for us, um, at, uh, near the White House for us tonight. Ali, get us up to speed on what we think the president's going to talk about, because I know we just got the notification late that he's going to speak in the diplomatic room, but we're still not 100 percent sure what he's going to address. Yeah, Tom, and there have been big questions over what we could see the president do next after he returned uh, to the White House from Virginia, where he did uh, address this, uh, this special counsel report uh, partially when he delivered remarks in front of the House Democrats. He notably did not uh, pay uh, any remarks to those mentions of uh, his memory lapses and his age. He specifically uh, just talked about how uh, that this report would be over and how uh, he was proud of how cooperative and communicative he had been with uh, special counsel her throughout this process, as you mentioned, uh, mentioning how uh, the timing of his interviews that he says lasted around five hours and they happened after uh, the Israel-Hamas war began. But I think we could expect to see the same from the president when he does eventually uh, arrive here to deliver these uh, remarks, uh, trying to really uh, to, to really uh, talk about what was accomplished through the support instead of what we have seen through uh, those me those mentions of those memory lapses has been uh, just a, an enormous eruption of backlash, even from uh, Democrats within the president's own party, uh, talking about how politically damaging this could be uh, for the president. And remember, Tom, the, there were already reports that White House advisors had been concerned uh, that this special counsel report 
could potentially publicly portray the president as being careless uh, or sloppy in his handling of these classified documents. What we have come to learn out of this uh, special counsel report is far more potentially damaging to the president and his reelection campaign uh, because it really reinforces worries and concerns that we already have known uh, exist. They have existed for years now, these concerns about uh, the president's uh, mental fitness, whether voters see him uh, as able to carry out another term in office. And this is something that we've seen in poll after poll. The president struggle with the White House trying to flip that argument repeatedly, uh, arguing that uh, the president's age and experience uh, is an advantage to this White House. So uh, I can ex I, I expect to see the president making those same uh, arguments, trying to clear the air after we have just seen uh, this firestorm of reaction after the release of this report. Tom. Yeah, the White House and the reelection team can deliver the rebuttal, but no doubt it, it was a political bombshell. What the special Council sort of put into that indirectly involved with politics, but the way it's being perceived when poll after poll shows voters concerned with the president's age. I, I do want to ask you, you know, we know that the president already addressed this. He said, quote, today, bottom line is a special counsel in my case decided against moving forward with any charges. The matter is now closed. Do we have any sense of why he's addressing this again tonight from the White House? Is it because of the political fallout? I think that's largely the reason you're seeing this, because, I mean, I could tell you just from when the president arrived back at the White House, he ignored those questions from reporters about this report, and he made really a beeline to the Oval Office to huddle with his closest advisors. Uh, and usually, uh, at the White House press corps, we rely on uh, when the White House calls a lid or essentially uh, declaring that we won't hear or see any more from the president on a specific day. And when we didn't receive that after the president return to the White House, uh, there were questions over whether we could potentially see the president deliver these remarks, make another uh, public appearance. And I would expect this to be largely because of this uh, backlash that we have seen since the uh, release of this report, really, that uh, reaction only growing, as we've seen uh, not just Democrats, but also Republicans in the form of, uh, we've even seen GOP lawmakers uh, use this as ammunition against the president. We've seen Former President Trump uh, repeatedly post about this on his social media platforms, the campaign already putting out statements, seizing on this report and trying to use the language that special counsel her uses in this report to weaponize that and be able to use it against uh, President Biden. So I would expect that to be largely the calculus by the White House tonight. Ali, you know, you said something interesting. Walk us through that timeline again, because usually people don't get sort of uh, a look at that or sort of understand the machinations of the White House schedule. It's something that, that you and I maybe see a lot uh, because, you know, we, we see the president's schedule. We're privy to that. But talk to us about what the schedule said and how it changed. Sure. So this morning, we just understood the president to, uh, after he had, of course, his daily uh, briefing of national security activities, we expected him to go to Leesburg, Virginia, uh, to speak with uh, House Democrats about, uh, essentially at their policy retreat, to talk about their issues and their priorities for the year. Uh, he came back to the White House, uh, and there weren't any other activities on his schedule for the night. So there were lots of questions over what we could potentially see the president President do after we didn't see, as I mentioned, the reporters and the White House call that what we call a lid uh, or basically a capping off of the day, uh, a confirmation that we would not see or hear from the president after that declaration. And when we didn't receive that, there were lots of questions over what could potentially fill this empty time, what we could potentially see the president do uh, after he returned here to the White House. And now uh, the White House officially announcing that he will deliver these remarks and as you mentioned before I joined you, we still cannot confirm that these remarks are in relation to this report, but that is largely the belief that these uh, remarks will have to do and will respond to this report by Special Counsel Her released earlier today, Tom. And uh, Ali, the, the, the sort of the documentation about the issues with memory come at a tough time for the president, right? Just this week, too, he's had some moments recently speaking of foreign leaders where he got the current foreign leaders or the foreign leaders at the time confused with European leaders who, who have since died. 
absolutely. This is a report that would have been damaging to any president at any time, but it comes at a time when the White House is trying to clear up these concerns and trying to spin this argument to as be as best as they can in their favor. And as you mentioned, there were uh, several gaffes by the president earlier this week uh, made during private fundraisers related to these since deceased world leaders. Uh, and that was uh, an awkward point of conversation during even the White House press briefing today with uh, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre being asked about that uh, and whether voters' concerns about the president's age were legitimate given uh, those gaffes that we saw earlier this week. And it, it was a, a very difficult explanation for the press secretary to have to go through. Uh, and she compared uh, these uh, gaffes by the president to other mistakes that other leaders and other politicians make. But uh, a reporter in the White House press briefing today saying that those people that she did mention were significantly younger than the president, reinforcing those concerns, those worries by voters across the country that we see in poll after poll, uh, that the president may not be mentally fit enough to uh, serve in a second term. Uh, and that is something that already we are seeing uh, the, uh, uh, the Trump campaign, former President Trump, already sees on Tom. Ali, you know, talk to our viewers about sort of how rare this is for this White House, right? Um, usually you use that phrase lid when essentially, you know, photos, reporting is, is going to slow down because the president's going to retire for the night, if you will. Um, how rare is this for this to happen at night, unplanned like this for this White House recently? This is extremely rare, Tom. Usually uh, we expect these uh, surprise announcements for added remarks to happen, uh, as we've seen in, in recent history, as a result of some announcement of uh, potentially uh, uh, troops, pot perhaps U.S. troops that perhaps may have been deceased overseas or killed in something ha that happened overseas. And in recent history, that's the only time that we have seen these remarks pop up with this little notice. Uh, and as a White House as a whole, this is a White House that notably likes to sort of operate under what uh, we call, quote, sort of a less is more strategy. This is a White House that keeps, keeps a very tight circle around this president, doesn't, uh, doesn't really put him out in public more than they think they need to. Uh, very little impromptu visits and uh, interaction with voters, interaction with just the general public. Uh, so this is a very, very rare event that these uh, remarks would be added with such uh, short notice, Tom. Um, how, did, how did the special counsel Council's report sort of play throughout the White House from what you were hearing. I mean, once it came down and people started to go through it, uh, the headline at first was that obviously the president was not going to be charged. There was not going to be a trial. That wasn't going to move forward. But then the issue started coming up about what happened during his interviews, the issues and the questions surrounding his memory. When that started to come out, did, did the White House sort of realize what they had on their hands with this document? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because even in this report, in this report by uh, Special Counsel Her, there is a letter included in it from President Biden's lawyers uh, where they sort of negate the uh, the terms, the, the accusations about the president's lapses in memory. I believe I have a quote from one of those here. Um, I'll work on finding that. But they basically say uh, that they would like to see the special counsel rewrite those mentions. They say that they are inaccurate and give an inaccurate description of the president's memory at the time. They try to justify what he said during these interviews where, as you mentioned, the president had difficulty uh, recalling certain dates, the specific dates of when he started his term as vice president, when he ended that term, specific dates around uh, the death of his son, Bo Biden. Uh, and several other memory lapses related to what was included in those classified documents that were found at his uh, Wilming Delaware, Wilmington, Delaware home, as well as his personal office uh, here in Washington, D.C. So the initial reaction from the White House was actually included in this report in the form of that letter from uh, the president's uh, personal lawyers. Uh, but in the immediate aftermath of this being released, we did see the White House just refer to uh, the campaign, which 
again, is is brushing off these uh, these claims by Special Counsel Robert Hur uh, about these memory lapses in the president. They're trying to flip this argument and shift the argument, saying that you know uh, the Special Counsel is not a doctor and is not in a place uh, to determine uh, the president's uh, mental health, uh, and that is what we've seen. Uh, by large, uh, by Democrats in the aftermath of the release of this report, Tom. Yeah, Ali, and we're just seeing the podium sort of, they're putting the final touches on there. We expect the president to walk out at any moment. If you're just joining us right now, we've been informed by the White House that President Biden is set to take that stage right there, they'll take the podium in the diplomatic room to address something. We have not been told what we believe he will likely talk about we, he likely will talk about the classified documents, the mishandling of those classified documents, and the special counsel's report that just came out. The headline initially from that report was that the president was not going to be charged, there's going to be no trial. But then later on, as you read on, there were was, there was some aspects to what the special counsel put in that report, namely that the president had trouble remembering things, uh, specifically his time as vice president, those years, and also uh, the, the, the dates of when his son, Bo Biden, had died. Again, the president conducting this interview, we were told, right after October 7th, the attack in Israel. So his mind was consumed, according to AIDS. He was incredibly busy. And these, uh, these interviews were, were for a long time. They were for, for five hours at a time. Uh, the president is there. He's walking to the podium. Let's listen in. Let me say a few things before I take your questions. As you know, the special counsel released his findings today about their look into my handling of classified documents. <clears throat> I was pleased to see he reached a firm conclusion that no charges should be brought against me in this case. This was an exhaustive investigation going back more than 40 years even in the 1970s, when I was still a new United States senator. <clears throat> the special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. In fact, I was so determined to give the special counsel what he needed, I went forward with a five-hour in-person, five-hour in-person interview over two days on October the 8th and 9th of last year, even though Israel had just been attacked by Hamas on the 7th, and I was very occupied was in the middle of handling an international crisis. I was especially pleased to see special counsel make clear the stark distinction and difference between this case and Mr. Trump's case. The special counsel wrote, and I quote, several material distinctions between Mr. Trump's case and Mr. Biden's are clear, continuing to quote, most notably, after giving multiple chances to return classified documents to avoid prosecution, Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. According to the indictment, he not only refused to return the documents for many months, he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. In contrast, he went on to say Mr. Biden turned in classified documents to the National Archives and the Department of Justice, consented to the search of multiple locations, including his home, sat for a voluntary interview, and in other ways cooperated with the investigation, end of quote. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. On page 215, if you had a chance, I know it's a long, it's a thick document. On page 215, the report of the special counsel found the exact opposite. Here's what he wrote. There is, in fact, a shortage of evidence that I willfully retain classified materials related to Afghanistan. On page 12, Special counsel also wrote for another documents. The decision to decline criminal charges was straightforward. The evidence suggests that Mr. Biden did not willfully retain these documents. The evidence who said I did not willfully retain these documents. In addition, I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. Let me tell you something. Some of you have commented, I wear since the day he died, every single day, the rosary he got from Our Lady of... Every Memorial Day, we hold a service remembering him, attending by friends and family and the people who loved him. I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or passed away. 
Simple truth is, I sat for a five-hour interview over two days of events, going back 40 years. At the same time I was managing an international crisis, their task was to make a decision about whether to move forward with charges in this case. That was their decision to make. That's the council's decision to make. That's his job. And they decided not to move forward. For any extraneous commentary, they don't know what they're talking about. It has no place in this report. The bottom line is the matter is now closed. I'm going to continue what I've always focused on, my job of being President of the United States of America. Now, thank you, and I'll take some questions. President Biden, something the special counsel said in his report is that one of the reasons you were not charged is because, in his description, you are a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president, and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. That's How totally bad out. is your memory, and can you continue as president? My memory is so bad, I can let you speak. <laughs> that's you, uh, that's you that's. Feel what your I'm, memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, President. No, my memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory. Take a look at what I've done since I become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? You know, I guess I just forgot what was going on. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, voters have concerns about your age. How are you going to assuage them? And do you fear that this report is only going to fuel further concerns about your age? Only by some of you. Mr. President, 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 Mr.
And so I wish I had paid more attention to how the documents were being moved and where. I thought they were being moved to the archives. I thought all of us being moved. That's what I thought. Now, what was the last part of your question? Whether a special counsel should have been appointed in this case and in the case of your rival president, former president. I think a special counsel should have been appointed. And the reason I think a special counsel should have been appointed is because I did not want to be in a position that they looked at Trump and weren't going to look at me, just like they looked at the vice president. And the fact is, they made a firm conclusion. I did not break the law, period. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> been listening to President Biden in the diplomatic room uh, addressing the special counsel's findings of his mishandling of classified. Let's listen in. It sounds like I'm of the view, as you know, that the conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been um, over the top. I think that, uh, as you know, initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. I talked to Bibi to open the gate on the Israeli side. I've been pushing really hard, really hard to get humanitarian assistance into Gaza. There are a lot of innocent people who are starving, a lot of innocent people who are in trouble and dying. And it's got to stop, number one. Number two, I was also in a position that I'm the guy that made the case that we have to do much more to increase the amount of material going in, including fuel, including other items. I've been on the phone with the Qataris. I've been on the phone with the Egyptians. I've been on the phone with the Saudis to get as much aid as we possibly can into Gaza. There are innocent people and innocent women and children who are also in bad, badly in need of help. And so that's what we're pushing. And I'm pushing very hard now to deal with this hostage ceasefire because, as a, you know, I've been working tirelessly in this deal. How can I say this without revealing it? to lead to a sustained pause in the fighting, in the actions taking place in, in the Gaza Strip. And uh, because I think if we can get the delay for that, uh, the initial delay, I think that uh, we would be able to uh, extend that uh, so that we could increase the prospect that this fighting in Gaza changes. There's also negotiations. You may recall, in the very beginning, right after, right before Hamas attacked, I was in contact with the Saudis and others to work out a deal where they would recognize Israel's right to exist, let them make them part of the Middle East, and recognize them fully in return for certain things that the United States would commit to do. And the commitment to, that we were proposed to do related to two, uh, two, two items, I'm not going to go in detail. but. One of them was to deal with uh, um, the protection against their arch enemy to the northwest, a northeast, I should say. The second one, by providing ammunition and material for them to defend themselves. Coincidentally, that's the time frame when this broke out. I have no proof what I'm about to say, but it's not unreasonable to suspect that the Hamas understood what was about to take place and wanted to break it up before it happened. <laughs> Okay, we've just been listening to President Biden there in the diplomatic room uh, at first addressing uh, the special counsel's report on his mishandling of classified documents, uh, addressing that saying the special counsel decided not to charge and that essentially defending his own behavior. And then he addressed uh, a little portion of his remarks were addressing the issues about over his memory and, and whether he was still fit to be president. The president, of course, defending his own behavior, his own mental capacity, saying he is fit to be president. He's going to finish the job he started. Peter Alexander is our chief White House correspondent. He joins us live now on this special coverage. Peter, this was sort of quite uh, quite the, the speech and then quite the, the Q&A with the White House press corps there. 
Um, afterwards, we should mention the president started to talk about Gaza, and he sim seemed to make a mistake uh, talking about the president of Egypt, but saying Mexico. Uh, there was another portion in his remarks earlier where he forgot something else. Um, Peter, you know, the, the, the questions that were poised to him, I, I don't know if I've ever seen sort of rapid fire questions like this about his mental state, about his memory, but this seemed to me to be sort of a turning point in his presidency and, and, a, and a, a remarkable night, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I think American voters can decide if this is going to be a turning point. We'll watch that going forward. Obviously, this was a dramatic day and not a good day for the president while he was uh, legally found that uh, he's off the hook. There are no criminal charges that were warranted as determined by the special determined by the special counsel here. Politically, I think the peril is very obvious, and it's one that's going to stick with this White House and goes right to the root of what is one of the biggest concerns and criticisms of Americans of the Biden presidency, of President Joe Biden himself. That at 81, he doesn't have the mental acuity, the fitness, and he's simply too old uh, to serve as president for a second term. I, I was struck by the president's tone in his remarks. Clearly, he was angry. He was frustrated. He was very critical, um, as stinging as the assessment, 345-plus pages by the special counsel Robert Herr was today. It was equally blistering the president's criticism of her himself, saying, in effect, uh, to the assessment that found in Herr's view that Joe Biden uh, simply didn't remember a lot of things, his recall wasn't there, that he couldn't recall when his son his beloved son, Bo, had died. The president uh, was furious about that, really showing some anger there, saying that when that question was asked, he thought it was, excuse my language, it was the president's language, none of his damn business. Uh, some of the toughest language in the document by the special counsel described Biden, President Biden, as being well-meaning, a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. The, the president said, I'm well-meaning, I'm elderly, but I know what the hell I'm doing. He was asked by one of the reporters there, uh, as he has noted in the past, that he believes there are other Democrats that could beat Donald Trump, why he believed he should be the presidential nominee on the Democratic side. Again, he says, because he's the most um, prepared person in this country to be president of the United States and the best prepared to complete what he has already accomplished in office here. Uh, Tom, the bottom line for this White House is that this is a storyline that's not going to go away Overnight, the president did try to make some clarifications that some of the headlines that come out of this about the willful retention of classified documents later in this large report, the special counsel appears to sort of couch those statements saying, as it relates to the Afghanistan documents, that there isn't sufficient evidence to show willful retention of classified documents. But it does a couple of things. Uh, one, what what you note is that the same way that the indictments of Donald Trump for his mishandling, as it was, uh, as alleged, by the special counsel of classified documents in Mar-a-Lago has become basically, all these indictments have become advantageous for him, certainly in the primary. Here, you have the president of the United States who has found that there are no charges necessary. There was no crime committed, and yet this is a major disadvantage. This is a real problem for him because it does get to the root of that final, uh, of, of that defining issue for a lot of Americans as it relates to this president. I was struck that he stayed in the room initially as long as he did and then that he didn't stay longer, frankly. I can only imagine the expressions of staff that were gathered with him. But at moments like this, Tom, I think the White House's impression, having spoken to age there over the course of the day, was when this comes out, we want to address it and we want to get all the questions and all the answers out immediately to try to sort of blunt this stinging assessment before it drags on for days. I don't know that they're going to be able to do that clearly. I think that was initially the desire here, but there still are obviously a lot of questions to be answered and a lot of Americans who are going to be learning about this and asking their own questions over the course of the next several days, weeks, and who knows, months. And Peter, you know, we were talking with Ali Rafa earlier about this. The president already addressed the special counsel's report earlier tonight, and then suddenly the White House announces that the president's going to make remarks tonight. And Ali was pointing out how highly unusual this is for the president, for the White House. Do you think sort of the, the, the avalanche of bad news coming out politically uh, from, from everywhere, right? And most of the headlines are the same, you know, legally exonerated, a political nightmare. Do you think it's because of the, of the political fallout that the president decided to address the nation tonight? I think to the point I was making before, I mean, this wasn't, he addressed the nation. We took it live as we're watching it. 
right now. This is not like this was a, an Oval Office address. Right. The president made remarks earlier to Democrats. A lot of it wasn't seen by Americans. They knew this was a big issue. They wanted the president to be out front about it, to be transparent. That's why after the White House special, excuse me, the White House counsel's office and the president's personal lawyers had their own opportunity this week, Tom, to review the entire her report, the entire special counsel report that they they effectively declined any executive privilege there. They said, put it all out there. They recognized um, how it would be politically impactful and damaging to them. But I think a lot of the language that you're that, that you hear when you speak to those in the Justice Department communities, that was a bit gratuitous. They feel certainly the president's allies, his defenders, his lawyers, the counsel's office have said a lot of this information, a lot of the way this was detailed was, in their words, inappropriate, gratuitous, um, as, as many of them described it to me over the course of the last couple of hours here. Because at the end of the day, really, it was the special counsel's job not to make any assessments about Joe Biden's memory issues or what struck him, but just say whether this guy should be charged with any crimes here or he had any criminal liability uh, under the circumstances here. So I think that's going to be a, um, a lingering anger and frustration. It's reminiscent of what happened with James Comey uh, several years ago when he made his highly publicized comments about Hillary Clinton and sort of put, as the Democrats described it, spin on the ball saying that no charges, you know, that she hadn't done anything that warranted charges, but that uh, she was effectively sloppy, sloppy in her handling, handling of classified information. That was a political dagger, if it wasn't a legal one, for Hillary Clinton at the time. Peter, are, 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 the, are the criticisms over uh, the, the memory issues and, and highlighting uh, some of the missteps earlier this week and then just now with the, the president of Mexico and Gaza, have those gotten worse um, over the last year or so, or has it ha kind of been the same criticism since he's, since he's taken office? It's a good question. Certainly, you're referring to some comments this week, just uh, in the last couple of days. He referred to Francois Mitterrand, the former president of France, who passed away almost 30 years ago. He meant to be referring to President Macron of France just yesterday. Uh, he was referring to the Chancellor Angela Merkel, but he referred to Helmut Kohl instead, who served as chancellor many years earlier. So it's those moments that I think in this sort of climate get amplified. I will note um, and, I'm, and Democrats have pinged me to say just as much over the course of the day. You know, you look at Donald Trump who's only a few years younger than Joe Biden here. And Donald Trump criticized Nikki Haley as she was quick to attack him on uh, blaming Nancy Pelosi or saying that Nikki Haley was the one who was in charge of the Capitol during January 6th. As Haley said, I was nowhere near the Capitol on January 6th. That was Nancy Pelosi at the time. Right. So Americans are going to have to make their own assessments about all of that. I've covered the last three presidents. I've certainly heard misspeak. Uh, misspoken words by all of them. For Joe Biden, certainly it gets a lot more attention. We focus on it, um, I think, a, a lot more. But I, I, I'm really not in a position to say that his memory appears to be better or worse than it was um, when I first you know, started covering this presidency. He certainly doesn't have perhaps the same physical vigor that he had when I covered him as a vice president here. But as he said, look at the things that I've accomplished. And I think at the end of the day, um, what his challenge will be is to focus on those key issues, on the things he has accomplished and the things he believes he's best suited to accomplish going forward and to try to convince Americans that that makes him uh, best positioned to be the president for another four years. Peter, we've been told that the aides have said that it, it wouldn't be a surprise if he does not debate in the general election. We know there's going to be no Super Bowl interview. Um, it, it's been, I think, this last sit-down interview was, was back in October. Uh, my question to you is, do we know what the re-election campaign from here on out to November is going to look like? What can voters who are Democrats who are excited about President Biden, what can they expect to see from the president? I think you're going to see him on the road a lot more. We're already witnessing that. I was talking, talking to some top aides today about how the president is trying to do some smaller events where it gives him some, uh, some interactions with individuals. He did as much in North Carolina, did it in Michigan, um, did it in Pennsylvania as well that allows him to engage directly with Americans. But at the end of the day, most Americans aren't going to get to have face to face time with this president. I think it's going to be incumbent on uh, this White House, this campaign to put the president out as often as possible to hear him speak, to hear the way he conducts himself and to watch him. He has said to us repeatedly when there have been questions about his age in the past, watch me. One of the reporters in that room asked a question that he took uh, the, some offense to or some umbrage to where she basically said, you know, polls show that people have watched you and they think you don't have the mental acuity for the job. He pushed back on that. But at the end of the day, you do. You have to watch him work and see him 
more frequently, I think, in the eyes of a lot of Americans right now. And so I think this headline um, does sort of add to the urgency and the necessity that the campaign do as much. You're going to see a lot of him. He's going to try to make the points as best he can about all these key issues on policy. And at the end of the day, a lot of people, uh, I think, will focus as much on just the president they see in person and, and then have to balance that with their views on policy. You know, Peter, we talk about a lot about of, of voters and, and viewers' memories, and we, we live in such a fast sort of news cycle that things come and things go and, and you move on to the next thing, um, especially in this world with so much technology. And I bring this up because there's still 270 days before Election Day. Uh, there, there's a crisis at the border. We're dealing with two wars overseas. The economy, new reports showing uh, consumer sentiment. People are getting more positive about the economy. Essentially, there's, there's a lot going on. Do you think this problem right now, the issues with the, the memory, the issues with his mental clarity, does this stick or can he overcome this and move on? Well, he's going to need to overcome it to, to move on. I, I think the issue of his age and in the eyes of some, his mental acuity is definitively going to be there through the remainder of this campaign for as long as Joe Biden is a candidate for president of the United States or is president, that is going to be a heavy focus. And this is only underscoring uh, the focus it is going to get in the course of the months going forward. You talk about 270 plus days until the election. Tom, just back up and think about all that's happened in the last not even 270 days. There was no war in Israel, the fighting between Israel and Hamas. Just a matter of days ago, this White House felt like it was on offense. It had a cudgel, a political sort of hammer to attack Republicans because the same Republicans who had said, hey, before we want to deal with Ukraine and Israel, the President Biden was calling for more um, aid to be directed to those countries. They were saying, you need to handle the border first. So they put Democrats and Republicans, a conservative Republican, a former preacher from Oklahoma, James Langford, behind closed doors with those Democrats. They came up with what is widely, Mitch McConnell among those, saying um, the most progress in terms of cracking down on illegal migration to this country in decades. And then the Republicans, at the uh, urging of Donald Trump, backed away from it. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We don't support this. In effect, Donald Trump wants this to be a political issue, the Democrats argue, trying to weaponize the border as a problem and doesn't want to see any correction to the issues there because that wouldn't serve his purposes going forward, right? So that was just in the course of not even a week, Tom. So we got a long way to go in terms of what other issues may come to the fore to say nothing of the 91 uh, charges against former President Trump. He has a series of potential trials ahead, most notably you know, we know his name's going to be on the ballot, as it appeared the, the Supreme Court justices indicated today, and they're uh, still to be determined, still to be pronounced ruling as it relates to Colorado. But you got the, the D.C. election interference case. There are a lot, of, a, a lot of twists and turns to go. But in the simplest of terms, the issue of age, it will remain an issue for the remainder of this campaign. Peter Alexander, we appreciate uh, all your help with this and all your reporting tonight. I want to go back to Ali Rafa. She's had a ch chance to check in with her sources um, and listen to that speech. Ali, your first thoughts. Uh, we were talking just before the president took to the podium. Uh, tell me what you've learned tonight. Yeah, Tom. Well, I thought it was uh, very notable that uh, the president, as you saw, uh, walking away, taking just a few steps away from the podium uh, and was then asked about uh, the hostage negotiations to get those hostages out of Gaza that are being held by Hamas. The president uh, talking about those negotiations and Israel's response uh, to Hamas, calling it over the top. And then in a, a very poorly timed gap, saying that uh, he referred to President el-Sisi of Egypt as the president uh, of Mexico when referring to uh, efforts to get more humanitarian aid through the Rafah border crossing into Gaza. And that is that, Tom, is the main concern of this White House, as we uh, as we know that those concerns are growing, those concerns that have been there uh, really for years now. I covered uh, the president's 2020 campaign and those uh, issues and those concerns concerns, rather, uh, about his age, about his mental fitness, those concerns existed even before the president was elected in 2020. And that is exactly what the White House is trying to reassure voters uh, to not have those concerns. That is proving to be a very difficult task for this White House. As we know, you know, the election is 270 days away now, and we can, uh, we can just bet that the Biden campaign is hoping that voters uh, can have some shift of attention 
transition between now and then. But I, what I can tell you is certain is the former president and his campaign are going to try as hard as possible to keep this news and keep uh, today's report by the special counsel in the headlines and continue weaponizing that and using it against the president, Tom. It's definitely a new phase uh, of this campaign. It's a new phase of the president's White House, his time in the White House. It's something he's going to have to address and discuss, and, and it's likely not over right now, along with him dealing with everything else we've been talking about, two wars overseas, the crisis at the border, and the economy. Ali, we appreciate all your reporting tonight. We thank you for that. This has been a special coverage of President Biden's remarks following that scathing special counsel report. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight in this special report. Gotti Schwartz has the latest right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.